Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by John Paul Farmer, who's the president of WeLink Cities, the former CTO of New York City, and an advisor to Filecoin Foundation. And with that, I'd like to welcome John Paul to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Yeah, amazing. Great to have you on. And um, would love to just get an intro to yourself and a bit of your your background and how you kind of became involved with the Filecoin ecosystem. You've got a super compelling kind of background uh, across like kind of uh, nonprofits and civil society, public sector. Uh, would love for you to maybe introduce yourself quick and uh, and your work. You bet. Uh, my career was not planned out. It just kind of happened this way, and I've I've been able to experience life in the public sector, in the private sector, uh, in nonprofits and academia. And I used to say that I worked at the intersection of technology and policy, but I think it's actually a lot broader than that. Policy is a part of it, but it's really the intersection of technology and society. So what kinds of impacts are we having with the new technologies we're developing? Uh, Positive impacts, negative impacts. Let's kind of be honest about those when they exist too. And uh, it started back in about 2011, 2012, when I was in the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. And I was working with uh, an incredible entrepreneur named Todd Park, who's built several companies in the healthcare space. At the time, he was the United States Chief Technology Officer. And uh, Todd and I recognized that so many of the problems that we were facing could really benefit from new technologies, but the people on the inside weren't necessarily uh, the most up to speed on what those technologies were and how they could affect society. And so we created the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program to bring in incredibly talented technologists, data scientists, and the like uh, into government to serve tours of duty, for six or 12 months at a time and to work hand in hand with the folks who'd been there for a long, long time and understood government well. And we saw that was an incredibly powerful model that grew into the uh, 18F and the US Digital Service. Uh, It's then spawned similar efforts in governments uh, around the world and across the United States. Um, I went from there to Microsoft where I knew it was time to go back to the private sector. A lot of people said, why would you go to Microsoft? But I was really um, taken by the vision that Satya Nadella had just laid out when he became CEO and, uh, and, and the opportunity for a company like Microsoft, with the history it had to embrace open source and to embrace, uh, local needs, uh, seemed like something that was really interesting. And that's what I did there is I brought the technology to where I felt like it was needed most. An example of that would be machine learning for translation. Um, governments often have laws on the books that say they have to translate their content into certain languages that are spoken um, by people in that community. And they often don't do it because they just can't afford to hire human translators. Um, and there were technologies that were being developed and obviously have gotten better and better over the years that make that economical and allow people to actually fulfill the letter of the law and the mission that they have. Um, and so that's what I was able to do, uh, those kinds of things at Microsoft. That led the mayor of New York City to say, hey, I'd like you to become the chief technology officer of the city. I accepted that job in 2019, had no idea there'd be this pandemic, um, but we were able to both respond to the needs in that moment that were really acute in New York City, but also set in motion some really big uh, big actions. For example, broadband uh, for all and really closing the digital divide. How do you change a broadband marketplace that uh, that, that is the way it is today? Um, digital services uh, within government, but also advanced technologies. Um, so we created uh, an Internet of Things strategy, an artificial intelligence strategy, the first American city to do that. And we deployed, we deployed um, water sensors for flooding. Uh, we deployed air quality sensors that instead of several, a dozen stationary sensors uh, that would measure air quality over the course of a couple of weeks a year, we were able to put air quality monitors on uh, hundreds of fleet vehicles and to create hundreds of thousands of data points uh, around the city. And so to get much more hyper-local and much more granular with the reality that we were seeing in the city, um, technology helped us do that. And it made us better equipped to make better decisions on behalf uh, of the people that we served. Uh, and I went from there to uh, to Wheeling Cities, where I'm the president, and bringing a really cutting edge millimeter wave technology allows us to extend fiber wirelessly and deliver the highest quality, highest bandwidth, highest speed uh, networks at a fraction of the cost. So now they're actually affordable in places like South Los Angeles and East Los Angeles that are historically overlooked and and digitally redlined. But also when you think of the global South and you think about uh, anything from favelas in Brazil uh, to shanty towns in in Lagos, 
those now also um, can get the best speeds out there. And so we can create a world uh, of digital abundance instead of a world of digital haves and have nots. So again, this is kind of the path I've taken in my career and how I've worked on the intersection of technology and the impact it has on society. Because I think at the end of the day, um, you know, these are tools, um, but they're only as good as the people that use them. And so we've got to choose collectively to come together um, across government, nonprofits, for-profits, uh, academia, come together, each bring what we can and figure out how do we get the most out of the new technologies that are available to us today. That's super interesting, uh, particularly with your work with with ex like expanding broadband, ex expanding kind of like the, you know, that last mile of Internet access for some of these communities that that would have necessarily had access to these things, uh, you know, kind of under the, the current regime or the current the current structure. And um, yeah, it makes a huge difference, right? Because these are the people that would arguably benefit from these types of things the most, but haven't necessarily had the most uh, haven't necessarily had the access that they that 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 it's not as economical for some of the service providers in the current models to necessarily be going and servicing these communities in a lot of occasions. Right. Right. So, um, so yeah, very inspiring work you're doing there. So congratulations on that. Um, so the, the focus of this interview is we're talking about decentralized technologies, trust and elections. And obviously this is a bit of a maybe hot button topic right now, just given that we're about three weeks out from the US presidential election. Uh, but we've also had a lot of other major elections around the world this year. I think it's something like 64 ish total elections that have been uh, national elections that have been happening around the world and um and what's 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 the big deal about that well elections happen all the time uh but these elections are occurring alongside uh really like the emergence of ai becoming kind of like a consumer retail facing technology you also have massive battles being fought on the kind of the misinformation content moderation front um these are being fought kind of on on you know multiple fronts i should say and would love to maybe uh, just hear from you about like why do you think 2024 has maybe become kind of like a bellwether year for elections or like how uh, kind of how we how we we view elections in the digital age? Yeah, there are a lot of people who are saying this is the year of elections. This is the year of democracy because something like uh, half of the the people on the planet have some kind of major leadership election that either has occurred already in 2024 or is coming up. Uh, so you've got countries like like India and Taiwan and, and Indonesia and obviously the United States of America. Um, there are dozens more. So I think some some number over sixty, I think, uh, uh, countries that are are at this precipice right now. And it's really interesting because of where we are with technologies, technologies like generative AI that are now broadly available in a way that they weren't just four years ago, and um, that creates a lot of questions. And it creates questions both in terms of where these technologies are used, but also where people are worried and aren't sure, um, even if they're not being used. And so it creates more and more questions around trust. And I think there are really two, two issues at hand here. One is power and the other is trust. So the question is, who's got power? Um, power in the form of elected office, for example, in a democracy, but also power in the form of the ability to use tools that sway uh, decision making. Um, so there are a lot of people who aren't actually being elected, but they've got a lot of power today. Uh, it might be that they are, you know, donating large sums of money, um, where that's a way to uh, to move the needle on elections. But it can also be using tools like generative AI in ways that are either appropriate or inappropriate. And um, and that's this going back to this question of trust. You know, we we don't live in an age where people see you know three newscasters every night and believe what they say is reality. We live in a very fragmented information ecosystem. And so today we've got to figure it out on our own. And um, the tools that uh, you know people have at their disposal today um, can make that hard, can make that hard to know what to believe or not to believe, what to trust or not to trust. And there are several different ways to look at this problem. Um, one, you can look at what about for the folks who, who want to know, who want to know what to believe? And that might be you know, journalists. Uh, it might be it's a segment of the population that really wants to know what's the what's the provenance, what's what's true. Um, and then on the other side, you've got people who maybe aren't thinking about it, aren't worried about, it, or even people who really just want information to confirm their priors. And there, you've got a different problem because simply being able to say, well, we've got a watermark, or we've got some kind of uh, uh, digital trail of of you know where this was created and by whom and whether it's been altered that in and of itself isn't necessarily enough. 
So you've got different audiences and you've got to come with different solutions uh, for those different audiences. But the good news is there's a lot of work going on. Um, we're in something of an arms race where people are learning how to use these tools uh, to subvert um, uh, the will of the people in some places. But at the same time, you've got people learning how to use these tools uh, to ensure that that will is not subverted and that elections really do reflect the will of the people uh, and people get the government that they that they want. Yeah, it seems like with this, these concerns around like AI generated media potentially influencing uh, voters in some capacity or undermining trust in some capacity, it kind of seems like you have maybe like two audiences for this where you have your actual, uh, you know, swing voters who are, you know, seeking, they're, they're, they're looking for the information, they're like looking to try to find like which candidate should I support. And, you know, that might become a bit difficult if you're being bombarded with like fake information or, or fake videos or fake images or whatnot on a daily basis. But then you also have your uh, your kind your folks who kind of live in their like they've already got their mind made up they already kind of live in their little ideological tower and they're just looking for information that kind of reinforces what they already believe right and you know if you believe that uh, for example like you know you know the U.S. is being like bombarded by like you know foreign immigrants from from the south of the border and you see these videos coming across that may or may not be real or may not be in proper context, you're just going to see that and be like, well, that just reinforces what I currently believe. Um, maybe, maybe just talk a bit about like kind of how you see these, some of these, perhaps these different audiences being perhaps impacted uh, by this trend of, of, of just, of, of, uh, of the, how do you even say this? Like, how would you see this, this trend of basically anybody being able to create you know, instantaneous generative AI produced media uh, that can be that can be highly persuasive. Like, how is this playing with various like voter segments or just maybe the population as a whole in this sense? Yeah, I, I think this 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 issue of um, you know who your audience is and who you're trying to help. Um, a lot of the focus has been on deep fakes. And that's understandable because they're getting better so fast and it's getting harder and harder, even when someone wants to know what is true, um, to be able to, to discern that. And there are, there are initiatives uh, from various folks in, in industry uh, to you know, do watermarks and, and kind of you know, um, provenance. And, and so there, there are efforts underway. But those don't really touch on what's much more prevalent today and has been for the last couple of years, which is cheap fix. So it doesn't have to be generative AI or, or high quality generative AI, it, it can be, you know, the, the cheap first draft uh, that someone got that's got seven fingers on one hand, uh, or it can be someone in PowerPoint or, or, you know, Photoshop or whatever it might be mocking something up. And if that touches a nerve and gets someone, uh, you know, to, to feel outrage or excitement or whatever it might be, it can have the right effect. And especially when you're talking about that, that, that group uh, within society, that isn't looking for evidence that contradicts what they already believe. They just want something to, to confirm it. Those cheap fakes are really effective. And I would say that's in some ways a, a harder problem uh, to solve. Um, one of the issues we've got is the way that people in government have been addressing this up to this point. It doesn't always take into account the nuance of where we are in this day and age. So let me give you one example. Um, when people say, okay, um, unaltered um, uh, imagery and content is all that can be used in political advertising. What, what is unaltered? Like the, the definition of that really matters because, in, you know, if, if I have uh, an iPhone, and I take a photo, that's not actually what it looked like. It's enhanced in various ways to make it a little bit shinier and a little bit prettier than a photograph that, that I might have been able to take with a regular camera. Um, if I've got an Android and I want to like, you know, like the ads have shown me, I can move myself up. So it looks like I'm jumping 10 feet in the air. Um, there are various things that most people wouldn't say that's what they're thinking of when they say deep fake. Um, but they are alterations to, to the original reality that somebody witnessed. And I think that that's a really tricky thing is how do you get the outcome people want, which is to keep blatantly manipulated, not blatantly, but, but, but manipulated to the point of attempting to create an untrue, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, version of reality, alternate facts, if you will. If someone's trying to create alternate facts that are simply not what happened, that's one thing. If someone's trying to make the view of the sunset that they saw on the beach a little bit prettier, you know, 
is that really something that, that should be held to the same standard? And I think that's something that hasn't been wrestled with yet. We've still got this world in which people are trying to create rules, but in the process of creating those rules, they're not necessarily um, considering the nuance enough of day-to-day -day life in, in, in this digital age uh, so that we can allow people to continue living their life using technology the way they want to without it being something that pollutes and, and, and uh, you know, um, and, and alters the reality that we do have to agree on in order to have um, free and fair elections that we can all then accept the outcome of. Yeah, it's a great point in that basically every type of content you see on the internet is going to be altered in some way, right? Even this podcast recording will be edited, which is altering, right, from its original form. So it, it becomes a question of, yeah, like what's the intent of the person who is altering the content? Are they, are they just trying to make it better? Are they, or are they trying to take you know, something that was intended to mean one thing and manip selectively edit it to, 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 so that it, it, it con conveys a totally opposite message, for example? Like it's just completely deceptively edited. Or, uh, and, and this type of stuff happens. I mean, we've seen a lot more of this type of stuff happening, I think, in this current election cycle. I mean, I think even just the amount of, these types of videos I've seen floating around on Twitter and on and other platforms uh, has been like pretty large where it's almost the point where, like you can't, if you see some of these like clips from, from news shows or something with, with politicians talking about whatever subject, like you kind of have to be like, well, like I can't really trust this because I don't know who exactly was cutting this clip. Right. Cause you know, you have to kind of go watch yeah. like, the full episode to really know like the full context. Right. I think that's, that gets kind of, con that gets a little, that seems to be, have been, been the bigger issue this particular election cycle than, perhaps like AI generated content that's been, that's, that's highly manipulative. Um, but it does kind of show that like these types of things, even just a subtle edit one way or another can kind of totally change the meaning or change the, the uh, like what, what that type of content is trying to convey. So I think that's something that gets kind of dangerous. And um, I do think like Twitter, Twitter, like the community notes on Twitter has been like reasonably good in trying to flag some of these things. Like, I think, you know, I'll give credit where I think it's due. I think I've seen a lot of these videos where it's like, okay, this video was edited or the community notes have flagged that this video has been edited or this video is actually from some, from like 10 years ago from a different country. It's not relevant. So I think there's using some of these kind of like crowdsourcing or decentralized sort of fact checking mechanism seems to have had like some impact. Um, but I don't think we've gotten to this phase yet where like there's this, uh, you know, kind of, we're just being bombarded with like just fake AI generated yeah. media, which I think some people have maybe feared we were getting to, uh, or we'd be seeing in this, in this, this current election cycle. Um, but maybe like just kind of going ahead on that, I'd like to, or moving ahead on that, I'd like to just maybe kick it back to you on like, how do you view just decentralized technologies, uh, the role that these decentralized technologies can play in ensuring election integrity, right? We have, Mm -hmm. Talking about blockchain, we're talking about like decentralized AI, all these things that are still pretty nascent. Uh, but how do you, you know, just maybe from a fundamental value proposition standpoint, like how do you see these types of innovations maybe impacting the role of, of election integrity and just trust in elections? Decentralized technologies have a, a huge role to play. Um, when you think about what do they bring to the table, um, whether it's cryptographic proof uh, whether it's incentive mechanisms, consensus mechanisms, um, there are real tools here that when you want to know provenance, when you want to know where something came from, uh, has it been altered and by whom, there are great tools to use here. Um, but I think the other thing to think about here is open source and transparency and the participatory elements that many decentralized technologies have, um, the, the use of the crowd, that, that might be the most powerful thing. Um, because when you're talking about trust and you're talking about the lack of it and the declining trust in institutions, no matter what institution comes out and, and how um, well-meaning they are and how, how honest and, and politically neutral they might be, it's going to be hard for any institution to regain that trust. And it's going to be very easy for people to, to attack it, uh, again, even, even without cause. But when you're talking about something that's participatory and open, um, and the example for uh, you know of, of community notes on X uh, being being one example, or Wikipedia, um, these are things that are not always right. They are not a hundred percent accurate all the time, but over time they steer toward toward being more accurate, and, and you get more and more people with more and more eyes on something uh, that often leads you in a in a good direction. 
And it just doesn't have the same vulnerability that a single institution has, a single point of failure, you know. Um, and, and that's why I do think decentralized technology is going to have a huge role to play in this future that we're now entering into um, because we're not going to regain the format of trust that we had decades ago when before cable news and before the internet and before memes, before any of those things existed, you just had uh, information that was fairly tightly controlled. And there were a lot of negatives to that, let's be honest. Um, but one positive was people generally believed the same things, uh, the same foundational truth, like what is reality? And and I was at a, a conversation recently with um, folks from uh, a government and they were talking about the end of reality. Are we in the end of reality? And I don't think we have to be. I think that we can use the tools that are available, these various decentralized tools that we've got uh, to create a new form of trust that doesn't look like what it looked like decades ago, but is appropriate and useful in this day and age. And so when I look at you know, where we are and what are the tools that we have available to us, what's going to be needed? Um, you know, I think one, all hands on deck approach. Uh, let's not rule anything out. Let's put it all on the table and consider it. But certainly when I look at, at decentralized technologies, you know, DLT, blockchain, uh, you know, open source, I think all of that is going to play a, a really key role here. Yeah, and I, I like where you're coming from here because it seems the 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 solution here to this lack of trust that you're talking about, lack of trust in institutions, is not necessarily to just go around and bash people on the head and tell them that they need to trust these institutions. Uh, but it's more of like we need to give the tools that will like facilitate trust. Like like you need to prove as an institution that like you're worthy of trust, right? And what are the tools that we can provide in a decentralized context that can help kind of reestablish some of that? Um, so this might be a good time to talk a bit about some of the projects that Filecoin Foundation has been working on. Uh, a lot of these types of projects actually around like combating misinformation, uh, preserving and archiving data in various ways. Um, you know, we've been working with a lot of projects like uh, like Numbers, Protocol, Starling Lab, uh, both of whom we've had on the podcast recently. Uh, Internet Archive, obviously most people have know and have used. Uh, Witness, which is another one that's that's working to combat uh, kind of AI and, and deepfake related disinformation. Um, wanted to just kind of get your sense of, of I know you've been involved in, with some of these in, in varying capacities, but mm -hmm. wanted to get your thoughts on like which of these maybe uh, uh, solutions do you find uh, maybe particularly interesting or, or promising? Yeah, I, I mean, one, I think Internet Archive and, and Witness to an extent have uh, are, are just known for being good, uh, good things to have. Um, you know, the, the fact that there are organizations that want to create accountability and transparency using video and mobile phones, which are now omnipresent. Uh, that's that makes sense. Um, the fact that you've got Internet Archive that's thinking about how do we preserve human knowledge in whatever form it's in um, and we don't let link rot and, um, you know, someone someone uh, turning off a server mean that knowledge, human knowledge is lost, um, you know, that would be a shame. And so it's really important that we've got organizations like that doing that work. I do think that Starling Labs and what they did with the 78 Days uh, initiative in 2020 is really interesting. The, the goal, of course, being to say, let's look between election day and inauguration day in the United States, and let's make sure that we uh, uh, are documenting as a society what's happening. So think about photographic and video evidence. Um, and they teamed up with Reuters to do this, where they they looked at the the, the, the provenance and being able to say, okay, what is uh, you know an original um, uh, kind of authoritative um, image, and where did it come from, and what does it depict, so that it would be harder for someone to misrepresent that um, afterwards. And then that inspired uh, Numbers Protocol over in Taiwan to say, you know, they had a major election coming up in 2024, and they say we could do something similar. In Taiwan, so I think you've already got this track record of organizations um, using decentralized technologies, partnering in many cases with legacy news organizations to give those legacy news organizations some capabilities they never had before. And this really reminds me of the work that we did way back in 2012 in the U.S. government, bringing technologists uh, into government to help government do something it couldn't do on its own. And I think in a similar way, you've got the ability here for technologists to give to the information ecosystem um, some tools and abilities that, that it just didn't have on its own. Uh, but one that I think uh, um, is really important to focus on is Ushahidi. Ushahidi is a fascinating organization for those who are less familiar. Ushahidi was started back in 2007. There was a Kenyan uh, presidential election. And unfortunately, the, the outcome was disputed 
And that led to violence. It led to violence in a variety of places all over the country. And uh, people started coming together, going back to that point of the role of people, the role of the crowd. People started going together and, and, and documenting what was happening. And then um, Ushahidi, the first thing Ushahidi was, was mapping that. It was a crowdsourced map of, of the state of things in the wake of this uh, disputed election, election violence, election related violence. Um, as an organization, they saw the power in what they'd just done and they kept going and they kept evolving and iterating over time. Um, so a lot of work on open source mapping uh, also did work on on connectivity and, and how you could do that in a really interesting distributed way that was that was tailor made for the reality and the needs of East Africa. Um, and more recently, fast forward today, you know, over 15 years later, uh, Ushahid is operating in a variety of places and they've actually um, teamed up with Filecoin on the uh, election data resilience initiative. And what's interesting about this is that it looks at what are the elements of election data that are really important? Because when you really think about it, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. So you've got to think about, um, uh, you know, what are your goals? Where you're trying to make sure that the data is secure. You're trying to make sure that, uh, you know, it's protected against cyber attacks. You're trying to make sure that there's, uh, it's preserved. You don't have data loss. I think one of the important things is it's not always a bad actor that, that creates risk here. Sometimes it's just, um, you know, natural technological decay or simply human error that leads to data loss. And so whatever you can do to create resilience, redundancy, um, that's going to help. And it's going to help uh, not just with election results, but all the things that lead up to it. So voter files, where where the uh, voting occurs, um, things around, you know, uh, data around the types of advertising, types of how, how elections were financed, which varies from place to place and time to time. Um, all of that uh, is at the core of what is an election and is the outcome, you know, appropriate? Uh, and does it reflect the will of the people? And so what Ushahidi is doing in collaboration with Filecoin is they're saying, okay, well, number one, you've got to do data collection. You got to figure out what's the data you're going to collect. You got to go get it. You got to prepare it and make sure it's, it's kind of cleaned and, you know, ingested appropriately. Uh, uh, and then once you've ingested it, where does it live? And that's where Filecoin comes in. And that's what the, the, the really foundational role that the Filecoin, uh, uh, network has here is that if you believe in decentralized technologies, you believe that this is uh, an appropriate way for society um, to you know, address some of the challenges it has today, the data has got to live somewhere. And Filecoin's got this incredible network of thousands of storage providers, and it's got the incentive mechanisms built in and, and, and proven for how you store that in a resilient and redundant way. Um, so that it can be accessed when needed. And that's kind of the last step is obviously you want to store it, but then what does access and retrieval look like? And so that's what Ushahidi and Filecoin are doing right now um, with uh, election data that could be a model for elections here in the United States, but also around the world. You know, we look at this year, this, this year of elections, and um, whether it's in Taiwan with what Numbers Protocol did or here in the United States with what Ushahidi and Filecoin are doing together, uh, you know, I think we're going to learn from this. And especially as we move forward and we move perhaps into an era that does realize some of these fears around um, the, the you know, ubiquity of uh, generative AI tools and the ability to create high quality, um, higher and higher quality every day content that can really be indiscernible in a lot of ways. Well, that's where these initiatives uh, or something like them are going to be indispensable because um, – it's, it's not a problem that's going to be solved overnight, but it's a problem that only gets solved if we're willing to use the, the newest and best and most appropriate technologies to do it. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. And it, it makes a lot of sense, even just from a kind of a fundamental first principles level where if like, you know, every, there's so many just layers of, of ensuring the integrity of an election, everything from you know, when the, when the, the individuals is filling out the ballots, like how, do, like how does that ballot actually get counted? Does it go through a machine? Well, if it goes through a machine, then like, well, how do we know that the machine is, is, is safe and it's not being hacked? If it's, if it's being hand counted, how do we know that there's, you know, kind of multi, there's, there's kind of poll monitors or, or, or counters who are, you know, there have offsetting biases at least that are, count, are ensuring that that ballot is being counted accurately then how do we know that, that that data is being kind of stored properly and is and is not being tampered with later on? So there's a whole lot of like layers to this that that I think when you when you think about that in terms of 
the what, what Filecoin offers in terms of the cryptographically uh, secured, verifiable, uh, retrievable uh, data storage, like that becomes you know, like really kind of a, a critical ingredient in just in, in being able to ensure that people can have confidence in that. Hey, like the, the results of this are are the results. Like this hasn't been tampered with. There's no funny business going on here. We can cryptographically prove that like this is what actually happened, right? So that's super interesting. Um, that's, super well, that's exactly right. I, I, I mean, one thing I would add, Aaron, is I think um, a concern that people might have about crowdsource or decentralized uh, approaches is, well, what about the PII? Well, what about the, the poll workers that you mentioned? Um, you know, we know that there are people, and this is not just in the U.S., but this is really globally, um, where you know people can be intimidated, people can be you know threatened. Um, certainly, when you look at uh, voter files, there's a history of this. Unfortunately, you know, in the the Jim Crow South in the United States, but also around the world, where you've got marginalized groups that are are, are bullied or intimidated into not participating in the process. And so, I, I think the critique that people might fairly have is say, well, wait a second, we can't do uh, anything with decentralized technology. The data has to be held behind um, uh, the walls of some institution. Uh, that would be their, their, their reasoning and their rationale. But I, I think that that's, you know, that the either or is, is actually a mistaken um, approach. And it's a, it's a kind of a, a somewhat of a weak argument because this is all stronger when we work together. And so we, when we see governments that are, conducting elections, that's part of their job, is they conduct free and fair elections. Um, and when they then do what they do, but they understand that there are these uh, outside groups and actors and crowds that are going to be collecting certain types of data, they can work together to figure out how do you protect uh, PII where appropriate? How do you protect identities um, of, of the workers and the staff? How do you ensure that marginalized groups are, are not being um, uh, intimidated in some way. So I think those are the jobs of governments to do that. It's not that the government should kind of relinquish their responsibilities. Um, but I think at the same time, there are all of these pieces of the puzzle that um, folks outside of government, um, whether they are technologists who are developing the tools or whether it's just regular everyday people who are going to kind of plug in and use them. Let me give you um, one example uh, of, of a... Um, I think I think a pretty kind of inspiring example of government and uh, the crowd working together in the state of Missouri. Uh, Robin Carnahan was the Secretary of State. Uh, this is a, a decade or so ago, and um, part of the job was to aggregate at the end of the year the death notices for the prior year of who had who had passed away in the state the prior year. And the way they did that was they combed through all the local newspapers and the various announcements and they collected these. And it took several people, I think 44 days um, to complete this. So it was kind of all of January and half of February was the job was just collecting this, this data and making sure it was accurate. Um, when they started opening that up to the crowd, they got the work done in three days and uh, it was more accurate. They just did a double blind process where, you, you know, it wasn't the word of one person. It was the word of a couple of people. And if they agreed, it was assumed to be correct. If they disagreed on something, then you had someone come in and adjudicate it. But much more efficient for the administration of it. Uh, the outcome was produced much more quickly. The error rate was lower. And you had all these people who had participated who could raise their hand and say, like, yeah, I know what that process was because I was involved in it. And, you know, whether I'm the one who had. Uh, you know, sourced certain data points or not, or someone else did, I know the process by which it was sourced was, um, you know, open and, uh, and accurate. And so I think that's, in some ways, the model of what we're hoping to do here is say governments can continue to play its role uh, as, as, you know, as the conductor of elections. But there is, there is a role here for people on the outside to play in um, making sure that the data is right and making sure that people have faith that the data is right. Well, I think that the, the system that you're you're talking about here it provides a level of agency to 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 voters and participants that maybe we don't have already. Where right now the relationship with elections, okay, I go, uh, or I guess nowadays you can vote by mail, so it's, you don't really necessarily have to even go to the polling place. But like, okay, you go to the polling place, fill your ballot, you put it in the machine, and you leave. Right? That's that's kind of it. And then you watch, you go to the TV, and you watch what happens. Like, who's going to win? Right? But like, kind of having a bit more agency, where like, okay, like I'm actually actively involved in trying to help. You know, kind of crowdsource the integrity of this thing by, by, by helping to verify information or or contesting things that I may think are are are, are sketchy or whatever. 
I think it may it maybe provides like a new level for folks to of individuals uh, in in society to just to 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 engage and to really like take ownership of the whole electoral process instead of just you know sending off your ballot and trusting that somebody's going to do the proper thing and count it and and you know everything's going to be sort of figured out properly. Um, and, so, and what I would suggest to governments who are looking at this, I would suggest to them that people want to do this and. To a certain extent, they're going to do it. They're going to go try to explore as best they can uh, to validate or, or, or invalidate, you know, um, uh, data sources. I think it's better for everyone that we give people the path to do this um, instead of them trying to kind of figure it out, poke around, trying to make decisions with only a little piece of the picture. Like allow people to actually have a pathway to participate in in um, and not just the electoral process, but you know, the, the entirety of what is an election. Um, so it's not just, it's not casting a vote. I think that's one of the really important things is casting a vote is, you know, something happens in a moment in time, but it relies on all this social infrastructure that has to be created in advance and the social infrastructure that has to happen afterward in terms of how you process that. And then how you, uh, you know, go through, um, uh, you know, a, a transition from, from one administration to another. So I, I, I think at the end of the day, um, people want to participate more today because in other elements of their life, they can now participate more. And so they, they kind of look at this piece around the electoral process and they, and they, they ask the same question, you know, how do I, how do I do something that goes beyond simply casting a vote? How, how do I contribute to ensuring uh, that this election is, uh, you know, conducted well, uh, openly, fairly. And, and then at, at the end of that, everybody can have um, faith and trust uh, in, in the outcome. Great. Yeah. And maybe to kind of wrap up here with, with sort of a big picture question, but if we, if we see 2024 as, as the test run year for conducting, uh, conducting elections in like a, a truly kind of digitized age, uh, what other learnings or, or safeguards or lessons do we need to be, uh, considering or, or kind of, you know, incorporating here for future years? There's a lot to learn. Um, one, provenance is key. Uh, being able to verify uh, the accuracy of content is really, really important. And um, decentralized technologies have a key role to play there. At the same time, that's not the entire ballgame. Um, there's more to do. There's more to do on educating governments themselves because at the end of the day, there are a lot of really good-hearted people doing the work, some of them may have been in their roles inside government for a long time. Um, that's often how it works is that just public sector jobs often are things people stay in for a long time. At the same time, we've got an underinvestment in professional development, training, upskilling for those folks in government. And so what that means is more of the work to bridge this, this gap needs to be done by the people on the outside, whether those are governments or nonprofits or, or academics simply because the people on the inside aren't resourced well enough uh, to do it on their own. And so my advice would be for anybody who wants to make election data uh, more reliable and more trusted, do the work. And it might seem like at first you're just, you know, talking to a brick wall, but like, like water on stone, drip by drip by drip, um, as time goes by, and you do that work, you're going to convince people who are on the inside of the value that the approaches and the technologies that you bring to the table have for them. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, patience pays off. And so showing up pays off and continue to have these conversations is what's going to allow us to come together, governments and nonprofits and for-profits and academics, and collectively uh, build the future that we want to see. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and it, it's something that I've been thinking about uh, in preparation for this conversation and also even just just generally uh, during this election season in that you really do have kind of there's, there it seems like there's kind of a talent, maybe like a talent gap mismatch here as far as um, when we're talking about, like trying to incorporate new technologies into our election systems and the kind of these new types of models. You know, this is, this all sounds great, but the reality is that people aren't, you know, world class engineers aren't turning down, you know, eight figure salaries at Google to go work for the like the Missouri Election Commission. You know, like that's just not happening, right? So, like, what are some ways that, uh, you know, kind of to your like reemphasizing your point here of like 
there's ways to sort of get everyone involved and crowdsource uh, some of this activity through decentralized mechanisms uh, that can help, um, you know, just bring this integrity, uh, you know, create the, create more secure, verifiable, trustworthy systems, essentially, um, while still working around some of the the just the realities of the, of the fact that a lot of people that, you know, that work in elections are like a lot of these people are just volunteers, right? It's not even really a full time job in a lot of instances, right? Like these are very decentralized things where it's it's local officials, volunteers, uh, a lot of folks who this may not necessarily be the thing that they focus on full time. And um, they may not necessarily have the like the tools or the skills or the education or the, the bandwidth to just be following all these things that we're talking about here. So uh, really finding ways to kind of open this up in a way that brings more just kind of trust and transparency and safety, um, I think in the future is going to be like kind of figuring out the magic way to do that, like kind of how to thread that needle seems to be, uh, uh, you know, how this battle is going to be won ultimately. Um, Aaron, John, if, I could, if I could add two, if I could yeah. add two things before we wrap, um, one, there are some amazing world-class engineers working in governments and it's, it's partly through the fellowships and the digital service pathways that have been created over the last decade plus, but there aren't enough of them and there never will be enough. And so that's why we need to think about how do we have, uh, uh, uh you know, open, um, uh, manners in which people can contribute what they know and what they can do. The second thing is that when you look at in the United States of America, the way elections are conducted, they actually are decentralized in a lot of ways already. Um, so much of the power and decision making happens locally. Um, and I don't think that the solution is to centralize all of this under one entity or one, one decision maker. But I do think the solution should be to layer on decentralized technologies uh, to enable better transparency, better accountability, uh, and then ultimately more trust in our elections. Great. Yeah, well, thanks, John Paul. Really appreciate your insights here and your time. And uh, why don't you just kind of turn it back to you for any final thoughts and then maybe tell us, uh, tell folks how they can get in touch if they want to learn more. Sure thing. Well, I'm happy to get in touch with anybody uh, and everybody. Uh, you can uh, find me online, John Paul Farmer on most social media platforms, um, or feel free to email me at uh, john at uh, phil.org, uh, fil.org. And um, in terms of what I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to the lessons that we learn from from this year. It's a it's a really big momentous year in uh, how elections are conducted, and um, you know every time we do this, it's a learning experience. And the environment that we'll be operating in in two years, in four years, in eight years will be so different from what we're in today. But the seeds are there. You know, the seeds have been planted, and there's there's no better time to prepare. Uh, for the future than today. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks, John Paul. Really appreciate your time. And thanks everyone for listening. And we'll be back with another episode of DWeb Decoded.